Before I introduce our last keynote speaker, uh, please vote for the digital poster. So the voting for the digital poster will be closed at 5. If you go to, go to slide out door and type 3525 and go to the best poster award, you could vote for your favorite posters. So welcome to the last session of this one and a half day conference. I hope you all had exciting times. So I'm really privileged to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Sabine Herlitska. She is the CTO and CEO of Infineon Technology Austria. Her professional career includes industrial biotechnology research, international cooperation and financing in research technology and innovation, internships at leading organizations in the United States like AAAS, Fulbright Scholar at George Washington University and John Hopkins University. Uh, she was also the Vice Rector for Research Management and International Cooperation at the Medical University of uh, Graz, Austria. Before joining Infineon, she was also the Director of Division European and International Program in the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. Uh, in 2017, one of the Austrian magazine, Industry Magazine, ranked her the most important women in Austria and top 10 business managers in Austria. So we are very excited to hear her personal story and personal journey. So please, let's welcome Dr. Sabine Herlitska. Thank you very much, Mustafa, for this kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure being here, seeing so many of you. So, seeing, seeing so many of you who have been involved in the Marie Curie scheme, either completed it or are on the way, getting your experiences. And I understand you had two interesting days of exchange. You got a lot of interesting input. And I also understand for, you, for many of you it's an issue to plan and consider your next steps, staying in academia, considering moving to a company, what does it mean? So I was asked to give you a little bit of insight into what it means being with a very research-oriented semiconductor company based here in Austria. And I will take you a little bit on a trip and comment on those three kind of elements. On the one hand, what is changing in our area, and of course you hear a lot in the news every day, what are we doing? We claim for ourselves that we shape the future with our technology, and I will give you some examples of what we do amongst others. We are currently implementing the largest investment, 1.6 billion euros, that has ever been done in Austria on the private sector and currently the largest investment in microelectronics in Europe at this point. And then a bit on opportunities and I was also asked to comment on my personal development and personal stages. So, digitalization. Many of you most likely know this picture, right? You know that? That's from the Pope. When the Pope was, the new Pope was announced going back in 2005, and you see the difference then in 2013. Many smartphones, yeah, taking pictures. So digitalization in your everyday life. And digitalization also, oops. Also an image here, this is from a family of our subsidiary in Malaysia. What could digitalization mean here? These are not actors, this is real life. A picture taken in 2017 and you see here the environment in Malaysia and this 
older man here on the machine, this younger woman, his daughter with the computer and digitalization as much as we talk about digitalization and use these buzzwords. Digitalization has to do with concrete, specific opportunities and changing the lives of people. And I have a lot of respect of that and this is what digitalization also comes up with. Now, digitalization is changing people's lives, as you could see before, and it's, it's changing it very quickly. And without going into the details, but I think it's always interesting to see the time period it took to reach 50 million users. And this is decreasing dramatically. And this charge is not even a one from 2019, but I think 2016. But here, look at this. 50 million users for the phone, it, it took 75 years. For the radio, already much shorter. And nowadays, if uh, some people are putting messages on Twitter, yeah, sometimes it's known within hours even. So that's the other thing of digitalization. It, the speed increases a lot. And you could even say change has never happened this fast before, but it will never be this slow again because speed is such a characterizing factor if we talk about digitalization. And here I give you an example, and this is very relevant to you because you use it even now, computers or smartphones. Well, you know all those icons, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or even Gordon Moore. And Gordon Moore, for those of you who are in the field of electronics, most likely know Moore's, no, Moore's law. Don't worry, I don't go into the details here. But if you, based on Moore's law, and if you convert that into the applications in, for instance, automotive, you would see dramatic changes that have happened in your smartphones, in your computers. Because what has happened in Moore's law, it basically says the number of elements, transistors as we call them, double every, say, one and a half years. So every one and a half years, the performance doubles. And that's the reason why your smartphones become smaller and smaller, your computers become smaller and smaller, less expensive. So if you would convert that into sectors like automotive or even the aircraft industry where it's a bit more significant because we are so used to these changes in our devices. A Rolls Royce, look at these figures, would nowadays after 30 years of Moore's law cost let's say three dollars and would ride three million miles with one gallon. So roughly four liters. This is the development, the change, the innovation, the speed that has happened in microelectronics. And we got used to that. Or if this kind of speed and dynamic had happened in the aeronautics industry, maybe some of you would have um, Boeing 767 back at home because it would cost $500 and would circle the globe within 20 minutes on five gallons. So this is the change that has happened based on Moore's law in all your IT devices. In all these devices we use daily. And all that change has happened driven by microelectronics. And my company is a company that provides technology and solutions in microelectronics. This entire sector has seen a dramatic change of technology and that is converted into applications, devices that you use. <laughs> 
And of course, this continues. And some of you might have heard of Industry 4.0, which means an intelligent, connected, networked environment, including humans, machines, diverse products, going back to Industry 4.1, electrification, the assembly line, computerization, and now the Internet of Things, and actually the Internet of Everything. So this is currently happening. This happens around us and it shapes our environment. Now, we are a provider of semiconductors and microelectronics semiconductors. We are at the core of this development. And therefore, I want to give you some of the facts and figures. We focus with our microelectronics solutions on applications, energy efficiency, mobility, security, and everything about data. We have at corporate level some 40,000 employees worldwide. We had a revenue of roughly 7.6 billion last year. And in our core markets, in mobility solutions, in energy efficiency solutions, and in security solutions, we are world leader in these two and number one, number two in this one. In our sector, which is a very fast moving one, you are either number one or you are not really playing a role. And we are a European company. We have our, Europe, we have our corporate headquarters in Germany, in Munich. In Austria, we are some roughly 4,200 people. In Finian, Austria, we had a revenue of some roughly 3 billion euros last, last year. And we spent a lot on R&D, 17% of our revenue, or in real money, some roughly 500 million. So if you spend 500 million on R&D, you're very much a research-driven company. And what are, what are those pieces of research? I ask you a question now. What do you think? Have you been a customer of us today already? Yes? For instance, we do microphones, small silicon microphones. This is what you see here. Most likely you don't see it here because the chip is so small. That's a silicon microphone. We are providing the microphones for every third smartphone worldwide. So if the sound is great, most likely you have our microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How did we start that? We started that some 15 years ago with a PhD. Today, we have, we have caught the market leader. Most likely, we are nowadays market leader in the small silicon microphones with almost 50% global market share. Now, if you think of how research, scientific research and application grow together, take this example. Here, there was a lot of research on how to develop a very thin silicon membrane connected to the chip itself and develop a microphone that eventually can be found in every third smartphone worldwide. <coughs> so this is an example of where you can find the link of, at the beginning, very basic research till you end up into something that finds its application in the market at your smartphones and various applications. And we have done that eventually after the first steps. We have developed that silicon microphone in Austria and we are currently producing that, manufacturing that in Austria. So in Austria, with those roughly 4,200 people, we do research, we do manufacturing and we do global business responsibility. So this is an example of a sector 
and us as a company that represents a highly dynamic field driven, as I have shown you, by rapidly changing technologies and eventually being able, with scientific research, ending up at applications that are close to every day's products and technologies. And there are many more. And as I have mentioned, uh, we are going to invest. Actually, we have started. We have announced that in May 2018, we are investing 1.6 billion euros into expanding our R&D and into expanding our manufacturing. Now, what's specific on that? Most of the manufacturing in semiconductors is not done in Europe anymore. Most of the manufacturing has moved to Asia or the US. Now, as you could see from this small example of the silicon microphone, we are talking here about applications that drive our daily lives, that are inherent part of our daily lives. So what does it mean if we are not capable of doing research and in particular manufacturing anymore in Europe? That makes us dependent. And therefore, this investment is not only big, it also has a very much strategic dimension because we believe in technology in Europe, we believe in technological sovereignty, and therefore we do this investment in Europe with the latest applications of digitalization as well. With this investment, we create some 750 jobs in R&D. And there are other companies who are very much research-driven and are close to applications. So if you think about your further next steps, staying in academia or moving into a research-oriented environment, you find sectors like ours around here in Europe. Explore them. There are highly interesting opportunities. Now, microelectronics, as we apply them, and I give you some of the examples, um, we tend to say we contribute to making life greener, energy efficiency, safer, and easier. Convenience. And you see here some of the applications. Like, for instance, radar technology. We have a development center in Linz, in Upper Austria, where, where, we, where we do the development of radar technology. Why is radar important? Think of sustainable mobility. Sustainable mobility will be driven by electric mobility plus automated autonomous driving. And autonomous driving or even automated driving will be very much dependent on technologies like radar. Or, for instance, electric mobility, new charging materials for speed charging, if you like, fast charging stations. This is done based on new semiconductor materials and we are doing research to making this kind of material available and finding, developing the applications for fast charging electric vehicles. Or security, security applications. We have a development center in Graz, in Styria, some 400 people who are leading in security technology. You find our security technology, for instance, in the passports. We are providing the chips for the passports of some 70 countries. Amongst them, for instance, in the US, but also Austria and other countries. Security technology, extremely important if you think of the Internet of Things, of digitalization. We want to have our data 
our communication secure. And this is what we provide here. Or, for instance, energy efficiency solutions. Um, digitalization is very much driven by data. Data depend on servers, server stations, server farms worldwide. We provide our energy saving chips for roughly 50% of the server farms worldwide out of Austria. This is technology having been developed in Austria at Infineon Austria. And the most recent one is a 3D sensor that some of you might find in your smartphone again for face recognition. And also developments we have done here in Austria. This is built on the best brains on, to some extent, basic oriented research, but of course looking into applications and trying to find solutions then for real applications. Yeah, we have some 4,200 employees in Austria. We have our headquarter, not in Vienna, but in Villach. Who knows Villach? Ah, quite a lot. <laughs> Villach is at the very southern part of Austria, and it's rather exceptional having the headquarter of such a company uh, here in Villach. In Vienna, we have increased our employees by 10%. <laughs> we are now 10. <laughs> yeah, but Linz here, Radar, and Graz, close cooperation also with the university. You see here um, uh, our uh, staff, some 50, more than 50% graduates, tendency increasing. We are a pretty international company, some roughly 26% from 60 different countries, 6 zero. And we always try to motivate more women to move into science and technology, and in particular, semiconductors. We have expanded our R&D staff. Look at the figures. We have currently 1,800 people in R&D. So if you are interested in R&D and finding applications, there are ample opportunities here. But there are similar companies like us in other fields, also in Austria, also in Europe. So look into this area and go beyond what you might know already. And of course, we are research intense, and you see the increase of R&D spending. We work a lot with, co with um, international partners, but also uh, the, uh, the technical universities, the technical colleges. We are involved in endowed professorships, currently six, in energy efficiency applications, data sciences, autonomous driving, the cyber physical system, in production and assembly systems, but also industry 4.0 uh, in production and systems and sustainable energy management. And here is the expansion I have just mentioned. So we are expanding our site here in Villach by a large R&D building and a large manufacturing expansion here. Now, on digitalization, a bit broader um, and looking at the opportunities. I think what's, what's always still, as much as we talk about climate change, you, you are aware of the Paris Agreement, but look at this figure. We talk about the global societal challenges, but the climate challenge is still one of the, I would say, most significant ones. And this figure here, still some 80% of our energy supply still depends on fossil. And not only is this figure dramatic, I think it's also dramatic because we do have technologies that can help here and contribute to a more sustainable and 
climate-oriented uh, energy management. Energy efficiency nowadays, um, I think, is one of the huge resources. And digitalization can help in using energy more efficiently. And also, you see here, some of the other, let's say, major societal challenges. Many people talk about that. But digitalization is not only a trend. I think it's a huge opportunity contributing to a better developing, uh, development. And again, why is this area so important if we talk about digitalization? Microelectronics, those microchips, they connect the real with the digital world. Why? Because we have sensors that get the signals, like for instance the microphone. We have processors that calculate, and again we have actuators that convert the signals, the calculated signals, into action. So, these microchips, microelectronics, is therefore capable of combining the real and the digital world. Now, if we don't have the microelectronics, this connection doesn't take place. And if we don't have this connection, digitalization does not take place. How relevant is it in terms of European GDP, as an example? Look again at those significant trends, the sustainable, intelligent mobility, the Internet of Things, everything about data, energy efficiency, driven by these trends. The estimation, the estimation says that GDP, the European GDP by 2020 will depend by almost 50% on those trends converted into smart cars, Industry 4.0, or for instance, an intelligent infrastructure. 2020 is basically tomorrow. Roughly 50% of European GDP is a lot. So this is where the major development takes place. Now everyone here who is active in, science, in technology oriented areas, you have a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of organizations, research centers, companies trying to provide answers to those trends because these trends are shaped by consumers like us. So what I want to say is ample opportunities in highly interesting research intense fields. Now again, how do we do research and innovation? Now first of all, we do a lot of research. And then we do innovation. Now what's the difference between research and innovation? Anyone wants to comment? Okay, innovation is to connect different ideas together. That was the, that was the unrelated. unrelated, yes. Other suggestions? Innovation is something which you think out of the box. Yeah. Yeah, thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. Even using an old solution, that's innovation. Yeah. Okay. Innovation is the generation of non previously existing forms, meanings, shapes, and items. And it's not restricted to technology. Yes, I agree. It's more important in society. Yeah. Um, yes. What what makes a huge difference? What, can an idea be an innovation? But what does it need to become an innovation? It has to find its way to the market. And that's the important thing. So every idea 
becoming an innovation needs to find its successful introduction into a market, into a technology, a product, an application. That distinguishes an idea, research, from innovation. A superb research result without being introduced somewhere successfully into the market is not an innovation. But an innovation does not necessarily have to be research. Business innovations as well. So what I want to stress here is, if you do research, that's perfect. But developing an innovation, you need more. You need to approach the market and be successful in the market. Otherwise, it might be an innovation, but not a successful innovation. And we do innovation based on research and on the one hand by ideas that look for applications and on the other hand by problems, by applications that look for solutions. And as such, create, execute, and eventually commercialize, and generating innovations out of that. And what do you need here? Yes, of course, sometimes you have to take big steps. You definitely have to take action, and you want to create value, because whatever value you create, you invest then for further developments. So we have set up an innovation environment, an innovation culture that facilitates this kind of research and innovation generation. So from my point of view, innovation needs some specific culture. And for instance, uh, it has to deal with all the employees that have to be involved with the systematic identification of new technologies, applications and markets working together, finding partners, doing that. Of course, taking care of the risks and the errors, and also creating room for new innovations, getting rid of old ones and, and generating new ones. Uh, in an exchange we had earlier on, we were talking also about this thing of risks and error. How do you learn? For instance, I want to give you an example here. We have introduced an award. Uh, every year we honor uh, with specific awards the best technological developments, the best innovations, but we have also introduced an award for the most successful failure. <laughs> the most successful failure is the failure where we have learned most. So it's about learning. What I want to say here, everything you do around innovation is about learning, further developing, and then creating value. So, so much on Infineon. I hope I could demonstrate that there are ample opportunities at companies like us. I hope I could show you what kind of approaches we take to research and to innovation. Now, I was asked to comment also on my personal development. Uh, I made it very simple. I have included here a short summary of my CV. And Mustafa has mentioned already some of the, of the elements here. Uh, I'm actually a biotechnologist by education, by, by background. I did my PhD and postdoc then in an international biotech company. And at that point, after having finished my postdoc, I have moved then to an organization that was facilitating European cooperation like Marie Curie's, the large European research and innovation projects, or ERCs nowadays. And we have supported the Austrian uh, research community in developing successful projects at European level. 
Uh, I have spent quite some time at various opportunities in the US with the US National Science Foundation. AAAS has been mentioned. Uh, the Austrian universities became independent in 2003 and I was appointed vice rector at, at the medical university uh, in Graz for research management and international cooperation, moved then back to this area of European and international programs in Austria, wanted to take some time off for my brain <laughs> and applied for the Fulbright scholarship and was then approached by Infineon and uh, became member of the board of Infineon Technologies Austria in 2011 and was appointed chief executive officer in 2014. So what you could see here is I did a lot of moves between academia and industry. I started off in application in industry um, moved then here to the university in research management, but uh, then was always close, let's say, in areas of application. And this is what I want to encourage you. Look into different fields, try different sectors, get your experiences, be curious because there is a lot you can discover. My most interesting experiences I got in areas which I did not know before. I did not plan to go to the university. I was entirely unaware of what it would mean to, to be part of a rectorate at, as, at the university. And um, being active in your network, you get opportunities offered, opportunities come across. Look into it and take the advantage. Take advantage of them. So I want to conclude by saying global trends shape our society and economy. Uh, as a company, we provide answers by technology to those major global trends in our areas in microelectronics. We and many other companies that are research intense offer attractive job opportunities. Look into it if you're interested in application at the forefront of your specific field. And from my personal point of view, uh, I'm I want to encourage you to follow your passion, to follow your interest, try new things. Uh, also in the, in the exchange we had before, I think I, I mentioned that and I really believe that if you fail, try again. Yeah, Google X says, fail fast, learn fast. Who cares about failing? Failing means experience. So take also this proactive approach and try new ways, develop your own approach. Go beyond your limits because there is the interesting area. And with this, I want to conclude and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the truly inspiring talk. I see I already have a question here. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for that fantastic talk. I'm sure we all learned a lot and we're inspired a lot. Um, looking at your CV, short CV, it's very interesting and inspiring. I would like to know uh, every time you made a decision to move uh, to a new position, what were the maybe three, three strongest motivating point to make that decision? Hmm. Hmm. I would say interest. I mean, um, typically I made my changes some six, seven, eight years uh, of experience in one sector. So, that, of course, that's part of your personal um, uh, orientation if you want to stay longer or if, if you get inspired by other areas. So it's the area itself and it's the people. Hi. 
Hi, really nice talk. Thank you. I am also a biotech grad, so I feel very much inspired from this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is more on the uh, world of like we are moving through this information age at a very rapid pace, the digitization and everything. And you mentioned innovation research offers a lot of new opportunities for scientists, and this is very welcoming. But at the same time, it's taking away some jobs, the AI algorithms or something, robotics that will replace us. And the education that we learn in universities, that might be obsolete at some point. And how do we, those skills we cannot, it takes a while to get a, graduate, a degree in an electronics. So how do you cope with such changing dynamics? Because at the same time, so it's just mm. a few comments on it. Mm. Yeah, very true. And therefore, we invest a lot uh, as a company and also personally in further developing the educational system. I, I think education at all levels nowadays has to provide the basic knowledge, but has to provide more. And in essence, I think we cannot prepare for what's needed in the future in detail. But what's definitely needed is, it, is the basics and um, subjects that are hard to be taught, but things like, for instance, systems understanding. Many of our challenges nowadays, think of a smart grid, for instance, is a systems question. How do different areas interact and work together and form a system. So these kinds of systems understanding, systems thinking, and how you shape systems, for instance. If you have classes on that, I congratulate you. <laughs> but I think we, we urgently need subjects like this. Or the other one is on complexity. How can we deal with complexity? Our entire environment is sometimes complicated, <laughs> but in many cases it's complex. And how are we able to deal with this kind of complexity? Now you could say data sciences, yes, true, but I mean for data sciences you have to be capable of asking the right questions. Data as such is not the answer. So these are areas where I want to encourage you to, to, to reach out and, and uh, I think these are examples of areas where I think the educational system has to further develop. And maybe a final thought, uh, because you touched upon it a bit, digitalization, there is a lot of um, concern about jobs being uh, disappearing. Yes, true, but many more, I'm deeply convinced, showing up. Many new capabilities being needed. And the two examples I gave you, like systems, understanding, complexity management, are such examples. So don't be afraid. That's the message. There was no preparation for that. <laughs> so this is, yeah, yeah, I mean, yes. This is, on the other hand, um, in many areas we see technologies converging. Like for instance, also in microelectronics, you see a lot of applications in the medical field, for instance, biotech and the medical field. So, uh, these are interesting developments, but in my specific case, yes, I made this change. I thought a lot of whether or not I should dare doing this change, and then I learned a lot. Um, hi, uh, thank you for the insightful talk. My name is Deepak. Uh, I had a personal curious question. Uh, because you have seen a wide aspect of different uh, aspect of project as such, uh, do you think Personally, what could be the kind of project where 
uh, people should focus more on? Uh, what are the kind of innovations Infineon would be interested more in, or also your personal choice? What are the uh, what are the what is that domain which you think is important where young researchers should pay more attention to? Thanks. You mean in terms of content? Yeah. Depends on your background, I would say. That um, each of you has 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 done his or her studies. You have done your PhD in many cases, your postdoc. So that very much depends on 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 what specific area you you decided for. But digitalization will have an impact in in every in every area. So this is, this is something where we see a lot of change. Um, and further, uh, I would also say this kind of business model innovations. Um, you mentioned that earlier uh, innovation do not only have to be technology oriented. Yes, of course. Uh, business model innovations, I, I personally think, are very interesting because for instance, in our case, we provide hardware. They are semiconductors, this is hardware, this is chips. Now, we also look into areas of software combinations. This might have an impact on, on, on our business model. And business model innovations are very powerful. They can really change markets, applications, and can be of high disruptive potential. And they are also very exciting. So I have a question here. So Mustafa has introduced you as you're recognized as one of the most uh, successful business women uh, in the region. Um, I would like to know, probably, I ask it a very odd question, probably, <laughs> um, but just to know you a deep uh, better, um, if you have told, if you have, if you would have told that you have one year to leave, would you still consider working in Infineon? Well, this is this is a very, um, I would say, everyone has to answer for him or herself, um, because it relates to this question: Do I, to what extent do I live in this current moment, or do I plan and plan and plan and want to start my life somewhere in the future? If I extrapolate your question. So my, my preference is always living in this moment here and therefore I have no plans further on. I want to do my job as good as I can and, and that's it. Thank you for a uh, very good, good talk and sharing this valuable, uh, valuable information with us. Uh, at the beginning of your speech, you shared a very nice photo with the couple in the garden. I would like to ask you how you foreseen the integration of human in terms of acceptance uh, of the technology, which is very fast growing, but we are ready for like such technology. Already we are integrated like many gadgets all around. So I would like to know how you foreseen in future, next future, in terms of like AI, biological data, safety, privacy. Thank you. Yeah. One could, one could think about this question in a more theoretical approach. Uh, I would rather like to give you a practical example. Uh, who remembers the smartphone being introduced when? You remember that? Well, the smartphone. Yes, it was, was the iPhone. But anyway. 10, 11 years ago. Yeah, 2008. yeah, seven. 2007, yeah, yeah. eight. So one could say roughly 10 years ago, 
And imagine how much the smartphone has changed our way of communication, interaction, of, of, of how it has changed the, 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 the way we lead our daily life. I mean, who uses the smartphone because making phone calls is so cool? Yeah. Yeah, you do all kinds of other things, and amongst others, you do phone calls. So, this is an example where technology um, based on the usability has changed a lot. And my hypothesis is that depending on our needs as consumers uh, and the usability of the technology, the convenience, if you like, that will drive the, the, uh, the application of various technologies you mentioned, like AI, for instance. So I, I, I see, I do consider that rather as a, as a usability and convenience and habit issue than a technology issue. And here, of course, we have to start thinking. And also on education, I think we have to do a lot. Because if you, if you consider using Facebook or social media, everyone puts everything on social media. Now, if you compare it to a data protection regulation where we are very strict, there starts a gap becoming bigger and bigger. So, I, I see the challenge more in bringing our different approaches in line with, let's say, our convenience, what, what our needs are, what we expect from technology, together with our societal, let's say, conditions, our legal framework, our values, and this has to be brought in line. And this is most likely the biggest challenge. Technology is not autonomous. Technology is shaped by us. Also artificial intelligence, we define artificial intelligence. That is not done by itself, but we have to do that. And this is pretty challenging. Could I give you a bit of an answer? <laughs> We have a lot of work to do here. And not relying on technology will do it itself, and then we complain, but we are the ones. We have to define the framework conditions. And that has to be done, the framework conditions and our values. Yeah, yeah. And eventually it's every one of us individually because this brought we, we. Who, who is this? It's this, this industry is driven by our individual needs. So it's based on each individual's decision in the end. Yes, 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 yeah. That's my point of view. <laughs> okay, I would like to ask one question. Thank you for for your deep insight, here I'm, here I'm. deep insight <laughs> first, <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> and uh, my question is because in our institute we talk a lot about women in science and how to encourage them. And you also just, just talked about like you want to increase the 17% in, in, in Finion. And what are your strategy in the point of coming from a company? And also in this regard, maybe on a more personal view, how is it for you as a woman in in this position and how much are role models in this sense important for you or for mm. you being a role model? Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we do a lot, like many other companies and organizations, we do a lot uh, in, in trying to make in particular girls and women aware of how exciting it can be to work in an environment like ours. Uh, and this starts from the very beginning. We have set up uh, a kindergarten uh, with science and technology focus, uh, have our science mini lab, 
for and and see the girls and boys with shiny eyes there so we start very early in conveying this kind of enthusiasm for for science and technology and this goes all the way through to our interactions with uh, schools and uh, universities whatever in the end Putting it all together, despite all these activities, the results are, let's say, moderate. Because despite these efforts, we have our societal model as we have it. And we have, that's my personal view, we have a very traditional societal model in Austria, in Germany, in our region, and therefore it's up to us to give examples uh, how interesting careers and professional developments of women can look like. That's the reason why I personally uh, go out to reach out to people like you and others and try to give examples and encourage encourage also my employees and in particular the female employees to talk about their experience and, and give the examples and I believe strongly in role models because in addition to all theory and, and, and everything you could read, in the end it's the, the personal example. So please also go out <laughs> and, and share your views. <coughs> Hi, I'm Matt Torre. Thanks for the speech again. And uh, I would like to talk about influencing people. Like, you are now in the best position to influence really a lot of people. And uh, actually, my question is, how do you select your influencers? So who influence uh, what you think? How is you select your own influencers? <laughs> Thanks. Um. Maybe too simplistic, but still I share it. Uh, if if I find inspiring ideas with people, as simple as that. All right. Hi. Okay. My name is Laika. Um, I just have a question. Well, before before my question, thank you so much for the inspiring talk, and thank you for thank you for sharing your experience with us. So my question is, um, has it ever happened to you that you created an innovation based on your intuition? and not listening to what the market demands, because you know that most of the time, market actually don't know what they need. <laughs> well, nowadays you work in teams. And, and of course you have the experts in the various fields, and I highly appreciate their expertise. And at the same time, I very much appreciate diverse teams, because with those complex questions we have in many areas, I'm deeply convinced the, 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 the more diverse the expertise is people bring to the table, the better probability we generate to come up with the best solution. And therefore, uh, I don't have the ambition to have the best innovation myself, um, but I contribute where appropriate, and I very much believe in diverse teams, and that is what we introduce and what we apply. Hi, I'm Amna. Really um, <laughs> hi, I'm Amna, and I want to know you. Like, sometimes it's like um, happens that smart technologies, or you can say sustainable technologies, they are more expensive, and people are not able to access these technologies. And I guess this is also the one of the basic reason uh, due to which like people are not more motivated towards a sustainable technology. So are you also focusing on making the smart technology more accessible to people by making it like more economical for them? Thank mm -hmm. you. I give you an example. I showed you this small microphone. And now consider the, the role of a microphone in your smartphone, for instance, plays a crucial role. Without microphone, making phone calls is quite difficult. Now, what would you guess? What's the cost of such a microphone? 
Make an estimate. Five cents. Ah, that would be too bad. <laughs> okay. Okay, currently something like between 20 and 30 cent. 20 and 30 cent. Now, if you consider the product cost, the total product cost of the final product, this is like 500, 600, 17, 700 euros. Now, what I want to say is, what we do here, what we contribute, is relatively cheap as compared to the entire product cost. Now, our products are cheap because we have to produce in volume. And we go into different applications that are, in the end, more or less expensive. The, 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 let's say the best word for, for, for what you approach is frugal, uh, frugal innovation. So these are products that focus on the pure functionality without a lot of additional um, side functionalities, let's say. We go into all these areas, but we are a small part of that. And our products are very cheap anyway, in the end. So the value creation then comes with the total product generation. And therefore, again, it's up to us as consumers what kind of decisions we take. The technology, the intelligence, the smartness of the technologies is compared to the total product costs nowadays relatively small. I'm sorry, Dr. Harlitska has another appointment at 6 o'clock. She really needs to leave. So thank you once again for a wonderful discussion. And thank you. I really you. appreciate that. Could you please? This is a small token of appreciation for you. So thank you very much. And have a wonderful stay here in Vienna for those of you who are not based in Vienna anyway. All the best to you. Okay, uh, everybody, thank you. It's really a wonderful talk and very inspiring. Um, and uh, it's been a very intense two days. I think everybody agrees, but I hope for everybody here it were two extremely valuable days uh, that you really networked, that you met a lot of people, that you heard new ideas, and that you have new um, things to do and things to think about when you leave here. I think that's really our goal, is to uh, expand our network, expand our imaginations, and really um, expand uh, our possibilities. So um, I want to ask the rapporteurs from our sessions today to get prepared here. We're going to go through the, um, the, the day, and then we'll have our final closing. So uh, just give me a second to... Pick, pull that up. Okay, and also don't forget we have the poster prize announcements as well. Um, so I'm going to begin with the, uh, the morning session, uh, project proposal writing, FWF, if uh, one of the rapporteurs is here from that session or if somebody wants to give a quick uh, summary. That's not you. Oh, yeah, Yolanda, please. Please don't be shy, everybody. Do not be shy. I hope you've learned that this time. Hello, everybody. So I was in the Austrian funding proposal, writing proposal session. And the main, one of the first tips uh, they give us is 
that they love our applications, they don't hate us, so please follow <laughs> this tip and apply. There are a few um, programs that one can um, subscribe or apply for. is this standalone or the Erwin Schrodinger and Lisa Miner. These two uh, last ones are more for international mobility and for uh, helping women. Um, there are other uh, special research programs and, uh, that one can apply for, or young independent research groups and so on. But mainly when one is starting in young uh, research career, this standalone and the other two ones are very important so to take in account. So um, I'm going to go through the tips that they give us. So for example, uh, we have to go through basic research, but some innovative points to increase our knowledge about the topic. So this is the focus of uh, our application. We will have to have a high level or certain amount of level of innovation and originality, but always follow some methods that we can uh, have a base, a fundamental base, not just uh, crazy ideas. So, uh, of course, one has to apply uh, uh, these ideas, and if one is not able to apply these ideas by yourself, you have to uh, uh, get some collaborations that can be national or international, of course. And for example, uh, what else? There are the reviewers, that this is an important point, that normally uh, nowadays they are changing the rules and they are all from abroad. And of course, because Austria is a very small country, so if one has to take reviewers from Austria, half of them will be enemies or co competitors, so not good. And half will be friends, also not fair as well. And yeah, so what else can I say? Yeah, we have to be enthusiastic and in excite the reviewers uh, in a way that they want to read through our story, our uh, application proposal. So first of all, we have to write a sexy abstract so that it attracts attention and go through the idea, questions, hypotheses, and have a good uh, general uh, whole group of um, uh, paragraphs where one can read through and read the, all the story and not just uh, uh, mixing up uh, your uh, ideas that you have in your head. So please put this, stop uh, writing, put the bullet points, and, and then from there start writing. So also for, for sure, um, a comprehensive English that uh, you have to find, for example, some friend or some collaborator that can help you in that if you are not good in English. And yeah, so go ahead and apply your proposals. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Um, so the next is the future of research. Um, I think it's a bright future. Just <laughs> that's it. Okay. Um, does anybody from that topic or that session want to just come up and say a few words about it? That would be great. Uh, future of research. Okay, we'll come back to it. But if you know we were there and you'd like to talk about it, please come up and, and just give us a few words. Um, a systems approach to circular economy. Okay, Pablo. So it was quite an interesting session today. We had uh, quite a variety of speakers, anyway, from share, uh, recycling uh, motors and um, and electric equipment to. Uh, extreme climate events and aquatic ecology, and we talked about many things, uh, starting from how uh, consumers actually uh, decide what to buy mostly based on the price, so that we need to change the mindset of people before anything can actually change in the world. And we also talked about policy, that um, Zomba Sweden has now reduced taxes for repair products, so that promotes businesses to actually repair products instead of buying new uh, equipment. And then um, there was quite a heated discussion on the practical aspects of circular economy. What does it mean to uh, have such an economy in the future? That these days most things are measured by money, and it's quite hard to go away from the GDP uh, concept which we have at the moment in the linear economy. And then it was also mentioned that 
food is an issue, that uh, not just how we package food, but we are going in the right direction, that the European Union and, for example, Starbucks are now banning uh, the use of plastic. But then in the case of Starbucks, it was mentioned that they actually replaced the plastic straws which are banned by some other lid, which actually has more grams of plastic than the straw itself. So the, it's more of maybe a PR move, but actually the scientific evidence behind it is weak. So then we maybe need more scientific assessment before we do such decisions. Uh, yeah, and then that was it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the next, uh, Mind the Gap, Equality and Diversity for Leadership in the Research Academic <laughs> Environment. Hello. Um, we are uh, very happy that we had the chance to have this session today. Um, I would like to start that with, the, with the numbers that we had about 45 participants, only seven were males. So uh, we hope that this will um, improve in the, in the future because it's one of the main goals and the main outcomes of the gender equality and diversity groups group, uh, which is actually to uh, change the focus uh, from only women to everyone. So the problem, uh, this session focused on the problems uh, of uh, uh, fair conditions and inequality, especially at leadership levels for researchers. And uh, we had four speakers, uh, Professor uh, Daniel Conley talked about the importance of statistical data for addressing problems of gender bias in science. He pointed out the uh, divergences in the evaluation of job applications, uh, job access, the bias in scholarly publications. The va he presented values about grant success rate, etc. And he also uh, mentioned uh, a very worrying fact that, for example, the ERC grants, which are are directly related to leadership um, have only 70% of applications that are coming from women. So this is one of the main points where, uh, as he suggested, we should focus on our next surveys. Uh, the next speaker was uh, Professor Maurice O'Brien, and he focused on the LGBT situation. He talked about the necessity of acceptance without exceptions and how to advance the LGBT inclu inclusivity in teaching and learning environments. He pointed out the need for working on uh, securing a safer environment for everyone, as well as the enhancement of representation and visibility in research and higher education of this. Uh, of everyone. And he also shared important information about the successful Cardiff Education Innovation Funding training program that promotes inclusion for LGBT plus people. The third speaker uh, was uh, Dr. Montobi Ngoloi. Uh, she's the co-founder of Black Women in Science. And she spoke about the establishment of the organization, the structure and the goals. So uh, the organization is dedicated to providing training, work opportunities, and networking for women from disadvantaged backgrounds, and improving their academic experiences and narrowing the employment gap that exists in uh, countries uh, of Africa, like South Africa, where she comes from. Um, this organization also works to give visibility and foster institutional representation for these women, which is very important for changing the facts. Um, she also mentioned uh, that one of the main goals of, this, of the organization is to provide short-term mobility fellowships to emerging scientists um, and to encourage international engagement and collaboration. And she mentioned that uh, for this goal, uh, any kind of any idea for partnership, such as possible host institutions and research groups, uh, is welcome. The fourth uh, speaker was uh, Dr. Tanya Romacho. Uh, she closed the session pointing out many challenges that postdoctoral fellows are currently facing when encountering the labor market. Um, 
One of them is discriminative situations such as the fact that sick leave or maternity leave endanger integration into academia as well as the industrial work sector. Um, and going to the conclusions, which is something that actually gathers all uh, the points of the um, the session is that the group, the Gender Equality and Diversity Group, has been moving from a specific focus on female resource inclusion to integrate a wider conception of gender that includes intersectional approaches based on race, sociocultural backgrounds, the LGBT, and other discriminated against groups. The panel has addressed the topic of inclusion in education, in grant research application and evaluation, in narrowing the work up gap and in offering visibility and institutional representation. And GEMS is attempting to reshape role models. There is already a, a platform and uh, we want to take into account this uh, new, uh, this, this recent discussion. Um, the platform was presented and Joanna Velis, who is responsible for that, was there. Um, so we want to provide new leadership models based on ethical caring and concern, helping reconduct career orientation and mentoring, as well as reconnecting research mobility to RRI at the level of ethics, gender, open science and governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really, uh, it's really impressive, actually, the, what you guys did today. Um, and finally, for the morning artificial intelligence, we will fall in love. P.S. AI love you. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, dear all, good evening. Bonsoir. Ye akshamlar. Akshamunis khair. Dobre veche. Good often. Shab Bekhair, Kehan Wa, Jo Este, and Shubul Shunda Mustafa. So, and sorry, I cannot uh, remember all the uh, and pronounce the rest of the um, in the languages. Please forgive me. Uh, uh, so we had a very interesting session, as everybody says that these are all interesting sessions. So uh, we talk about artificial intelligence and its effect in our life, especially in social life, not the technological way. So we had a speaker, Stavros Skaudos from uh, Pompeii Farber University, Stefani Cox from Austrian Parliament, George Langs, Associated Professor from Medical University, of Vienna and Clemens Rosner, CEO of Allied. So as you can see, many companies, institutions, and universities. We are, work all, we are actually looking for some answers for the questions like, can take, AI can take a part in our life, which has already been taken, might replace our jobs, workplaces, for example, lawyers and doctors, be careful. <laughs> already taken in terms of some issues. For example, AI can take a part in critical decision-making, strategy, medicine, and evaluation of it. For example, MSCA applications might be evaluated AI in future, so keep into mind. And for our well-beings in, in, in terms of empathy, psychological safety, and for people, for example, democratization, ethics drive in AI. So when we cover up, we realize that we have not that good ideas. We can just turn into the dangerous part or the good part. So we are in the middle. We just we need to be hope for the goodwill. The final point was actually be careful about what you're putting into the internet data. Be careful about safety and privacy. Take some courses in social media and safety. So finally, we were thinking that around 1,350 AI companies in the world working to make money. Uh, so the point is, and final one is, how to avoid next Manhattan project not to repeat. And thank you for your contribution. As a board member, I would like to thank you. You're without your contribution here being present. It could not be much better. I wish you have a pleasant dark research night, <laughs> dark side of research, and have a nice trip back to your home country. Thank you.
Okay, uh, that's great. So we're going to go really quick, try and be quick through the rest of the sessions. Um, okay. um, so the ERC proposal writing, do we have a repertoire from that session? Do you want to come and say a few words? Yep. Okay, are you the, the presenter? <laughs> I'm totally, I'm totally biased, of course. <laughs> but the idea behind this ERC writing session today was to have it a kind of as an early bird session, really thinking early about the preparation of an ERC proposal, which makes particular sense in the community present at this conference. So we're reminded also that uh, there's uh, figures uh, coming from the European Commission that an MSCA fellow has up to 38% higher success rate in preparing an application. But also this is only one reason why it's really a good idea to think early about the ERC, which is in many ways related to the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions, but has some specific features, like really the focus on frontier science, of, uh, only excellence, scientific excellence, however it is defined as the sole evaluation criterion. So the session was structured in a way that in the beginning we discussed about these key features, maybe the funding philosophy of the ERC, and then we took a closer look at this particular evaluation process in the ERC, which, um, which amounts to that you have to address your proposal both to generalists who really um, have to see what is the exciting part of your research, how your research will change the field in a, in a longer perspective, but also specialists who can really uh, be very specific, of course, in, in, in looking at the details and if the project can fly. And based on that, I think we had a very interactive discussion. Many questions were raised also in the context of some practical tips for proposal writing. I think the core issue being that, yes, the core novelty of your proposal should be really clear also in the short, short version of the proposal. And the overarching scientific questions are really important. So even if you have exciting novel methodology, it should be ideally embedded in a scientific question or a hypothesis that you want to test. And we had a range of questions, some of them amounting to how do you deal with risk, because the ERC is risk friendly per se, but they don't want to have castles out of thin air, so you have to have a backup plan. Questions also, how much can it be a consortium? And quick answer, it shouldn't be. It's really centered on you as a principal investigator and your core team. But yes, you can collaborate uh, freely and widely where it makes sense. Yes, and I think that were some of the questions we covered. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next is entrepreneurship, how to start a startup. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I don't want to take much time. Only a minute, that's what Mustafa gave me. <laughs> so again, we did today uh, the entrepreneurship, how to start your startup. Actually, we have uh, six speakers in this session. Our first speaker is Patricia. She's a MCA alumni member. She has an Oceanogami startup. So please uh, check for the startup if you want more information. It's a very interesting startup. They're doing a lot in the marine conservation research. And our second two speakers are Birgit Reiter, Brown Weiser, sorry for my pronunciation and Karin, they both are from Austrian Business Agency. So today, the take home is they convinced that I want to come here and uh, start my own startup. They really showed me how open Austria is and how much funding is available in this country to have a startup and how much talent is here to f find your teams and Austrian Business Agency, how they are supporting startups here. And our next speaker in this session is uh, Nicholas. Nicholas is actually CEO of Kazi. Kazi is a Belgian-based startup company. So in this company, what Nicholas did is he actually, he really interested in uh, making fun people and technology. With this, all these three domains, they made a kind of a survey to bridge the expectations gap between researchers and the industries. And our last speaker in this session is Pavlo Baslinski. He is actually, BSB Working Group Chair. So Pavlo actually is also kind of giving a startup training to the, all the MCA members. Pavlo already organized two sessions in 2017 and 2018, and he's also organizing two more sessions in this year. So if you want to know more information, please check the information on the BSB website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so the quantum frontier from foundations to technologies. Anybody? Anybody? No. 
No repertoire. Okay. <sighs> okay. Uh, if anybody has something, please come up. Um, researcher career evaluation under ROI, RRI, widening the definitions of academic success. Anybody from that session have anything to say? Please. Okay. It's really important that the people who can't make those sessions get a bit of feedback. So that's why we do this. Yeah. Quick. Quick. Yeah. Hello. I know everybody's tired, so I will just go straight into the points. So uh, takeaway points where this is a topic where a lot of dis discussion has to happen because a lot of issues are involved and which are important for every researcher. Uh, some of the points that were touched upon were that researchers are not paper-laying chickens. <laughs> And uh, researchers have a lot of other avenues and competencies which are not always uh, fairly evaluated. And how do we make this transition from having a current evaluation matrix where papers are much more given much more weight than other activities into the day-to-day -day life of a researcher? Other issues were also touched upon, like how do we uh, create more fairness in terms of gender equalization, um, how do we fight against discriminations, and so on. Uh, one uh, point made was that, of course, there are a lot of things that has to be done on an individual level and at an organizational level, and also as a soci society as a whole. Uh, for individual researchers, what can, we can do is that, um, for an example, if we want to be evaluated on other activities, we can make this um, conversation at the very beginning when, when we are starting our research or project with the supervisor and then maybe decide on different criteria, what is expected from both sides, and then at the end evaluated on those criteria. Uh, of course, the organizational and society as a whole, those transitions has to be made at a much bigger level. And there, we can start the discussion at the moment and maybe hope for the uh, change slowly into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, and lastly, uh, refugees and higher education. Okay. Um, so, uh, we had a speaker of a bridge program and also a, a policy officer from the EU um, and um, also a, a researcher uh, from Iraq about their experiences. So, we saw a very interesting mo movie, uh, Science in Exile. Uh, so we highly recommend to see uh, this and definitely in the European context, uh, the researchers uh, who are in Europe, uh, they really need support from our site uh, and uh, because integration takes such a long time. And uh, at the end, it was introduced a, a bridge program, mentoring. Uh, so I really hope you can look and maybe you can uh, share it uh, with your colleagues uh, or uh, you would like to become a mentor. Uh, and uh, so this is the message I would like to give that uh, we would like to support these uh, refugees. So just to keep in mind and looking to bridge program and also MCA is involving in that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, actually I organized science diplomacy and we didn't have a rapporteur, so I'm gonna skip that right now. Um, and we'll go to open science. Thank you very much. Um, well, what we have, we, we had very diverse um, presentations from what it means for an individual researcher, um, the open science, and what it means for an institution. But what we have come up is that for being a successful researcher, it's not enough anymore to write a good paper, but it goes far beyond. 
Funders are increasingly asking for a crossover between excellence and societal impact. And in this context, open science is there to stay because open science can help, can help you in many of those efforts. You can, by sharing your data and your publications, by engaging with the public and your peers, and about knowing more about who is interested in your, in your research, this will be key to doing good research in the future. But also we have encountered that there are still some difficulties, what we call dragons, to fight before open science can, can unfold its full impact. And that is that we still need adequate education in open science, and not only to the young, but also to the leaders, to the team leaders. They still need to be aware of that. We need new modes of evaluating science and also excellence and a broader definition of what excellence is. We need a sensible use of metrics and also development of new metrics. We um, need to revisit our current publication models. We need reassurance that research is not scooped when it's put into the open. And um, we need models that go more towards also acknowledging collaborative modes of research and how this can be supported. Thank you. Okay, so quickly about science diplomacy, I got a bit caught off guard there. So um, we had, unfortunately, one speaker could not make it, and uh, it was really about what science diplomacy is. Uh, I want to thank uh, Joran Beldegrun for giving two talks, one about uh, what science diplomacy is, and we said there are different types of science diplomacy. There's science for diplomacy, there's diplomacy for science, and then there's science in diplomacy. Um, we had uh, Angela Sarcina from UNESCO give us an overview of what activities UNESCO uh, undertakes. A lot of it is surrounding the um, sustainable development goals, and they really organize a lot of international projects. And she is also a uh, former RISE um, um, participant, and she's now working at UNESCO. And then Joran also talked about his experience in Swissnex, working um, with a Swiss organization, um, learning about science diplomacy, and now actually putting it into pra practice in uh, Israel uh, and Palestine, working on uh, sp uh, all, all aspects, really, of Israel-Palestine um, diplomacy and how science uh, fits into it. So that was that. Um, <laughs> Okay, so branding yourself. Anybody want to brand themselves? Branding yourself. Branding yourself. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. You're the next one. Okay. So, uh, team. No way. This is. Natalia, do you have some? Okay. Good. Thank you. Just like one or two minutes, really. So, for branding yourself, I can say to you, you have missed something. The whole people that were here have a very nice discussion about which are the main things they can use at social media. And I think uh, everybody that were here have a very good ideas how to position it yourself, even if you have a very common name in Germany. So have a nice evening. <laughs> okay. So um, team leaders, mental health. Okay. Oh yeah, Mango, please. Yeah. Uh, hi. Just stand right ah, in front sorry. Of it was a session to raise the awareness of uh, mental health among investigators, not just on team leaders and as well, but as well on uh, PhD students and, and postdocs. So if you are a PhD student, please talk to, to people, talk to your supervisor if you have some issues. And uh, if you are a supervisor, uh, first of all, check the resources that are available in your institution. And second, uh, have active listening to skills. After this, uh, if uh, if not as well, you can you can redirect, redirect uh, the case to to professional support. Okay, thank you. And finally, we have uh, supporting researcher mobility. Uh, Yasmin. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I'm, I have the last wrap up of the day and the message of the session is a good one. So uh, being researcher can be tough, but there's a lot of support for you. 
So uh, we looked at Net for Mobility, the network of national contact points for marine sclerosis career actions, and they can offer support for your application from the moment you are planning to writing the proposal and then also in implementation. Um, we looked at Euroaccess, uh, which offers information and support services for researchers who want to pursue their research career in Europe. And so, among other things, Europe of, uh, Euroaccess offers a huge top database, career development services, and personal support with regards to visa, taxations, and all the other difficult stuff um, related to being mobile. Um, cost. Uh, is a funding program um, <clears throat> for networks. And I think what's especially relevant in cost here for you is that there is so-called um, short-term short scientific missions where researchers can get funding for short stays um, up to several months. So I found that really interesting and relevant. And um, finally, uh, we looked at CASI, which is a project that bridges the gap between the expectations of researchers and the corporate um, employers on the other hand. Okay, so to wrap it up, um, there's a lot available and please really take advantage of all the support available to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, and just one comment. Thank you to those organizations for your support of us. So, thank you. And now I'm going to hand this over to Mustafa and we'll do the poster awards. And then we will have our final closing and, and introduce the next uh, GA and annual conference uh, location. Thank you. I'll stay with the awards. Yeah? Uh, thank you, Matthew. Our first post best poster award is supported by the Vienna Biocenter. It's the best poster on life sciences, so Laura Martinez, are you here? Is there any ordinary board member present here? Sophia, could you please? Uh, okay. So the next best poster is for uh, Giovanni Sogari. Are you here? Giovanni. You're missing wine. Don't don't worry about the award. Okay. <laughs> So, best poster award for mathematics goes to Victor Sander. Okay. Best poster award for chemistry goes to Sujata Mahapatra. Wow. Best Poster Award in Physics, Damir Dominico. <laughs> Damir will be in the team who will be hosting us in Croatia. But that has nothing to do with the Poster Award. It was a vote. Best poster award for environmental science goes to Elizabeth Smith from Brazil. She's also our Brazil chapter chair.
And a special thanks to Sophia for organizing the voting and everything. Uh, Technical University Best Poster Award for Engineering goes to Erisa Karafili. She's here. Best Poster Award for Social Sciences, Humanities, and Arts goes, goes to Marina Pekozovic. Okay. Uh, last but not the least, we also awarded uh, two days ago the Best Chapter. Non-European MCA Chapter goes to Brazil, uh, Elizabeth Schmidt. Uh, the, Europe, uh, the best European chapter goes to Benelux, and then the best working group is uh, policy working group. So thank you, everyone. Now just a short uh, closing from my side. Uh, I'd like to thank every one of you. I mean, uh, there are a lot of organization behind, it, behind this whole event, but the event is successful because you are here today. It's more than six past 50, uh, 15 past six already. I see a lot of people are tired, but you are still here. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for your taking part in the lively discussions and questions and everything. I'd also like to thank all the contractor team, all the board member, uh, very specifically, Matthew, you did a really great job at the dinner yesterday. Thank you very much for that. And there will be hopefully a great event. XCOM member Bala, Murat, Sophia, thank you once again. Uh, I don't know if Hema, Guillaume, I don't Anna, thank you very much for all the help. Odisev from the European Commission, I hope you, you have seen that how we have grown in last years. So I hope that you would push for more funding for us. So please remember that. Uh, thanks to the Intersoft team, Alex, Nautis, uh, Nadia. And most importantly, we have a very, very active board member, Valentina, who could not be here, who is in Seattle right now, probably watching us. Thank you, Valentina, what we ha you have done for all the communication work, for the communication working group. I'd also like to, I'd also like to thank all the sponsors, our, our main sponsors, Vienna Biocenter, thank you very much. Technical University of Vienna. I see no one is from there, but it's my university. Uh, and then Kazi, uh, it, we had a very interesting session today. Thank you for that. We have Vienna Convention Bureau. We have Johannes Kepler University. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from Johannes Kepler University? Okay, thank you. Um, then we also have um, a cost action. Uh, we have Euraccess, Net for Mobility Plus, MSCA Action. I think I'm forgetting someone. Uh, Austrian Airlines, thank you very much. Jobs.ac.uk, jobs. Jobs Marina, are you here? Thank you for your support. And Wiki Academy, uh, I, I hope uh, we would also continue in future uh, with all the partners, research in Germany. Thank you very much. And we hope that you will be still coming with us at the, at the next year because we are aiming for bigger events. So if I'm missing anyone, I apologize because it was a really hectic day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think he's missing one person. Do we know? Uh, there's one person that if he did not work and uh, help us, this never would have happened and it would not have happened the way it did. Mustafa put in so much effort from the time we wrote the bid to the time that you're standing right here. And please give him a round of applause. As I said, it's all your success. It's the association's success. Thank you very much. Now, I hope that you will, uh, is Maya here? So we are going to show you the, what Croatia has to offer for GA 2020. So, yes, yes, thank you. I think, uh, no, she has a presentation. Should we do the video? Oh, no. Video or presentation? Hi all, um, I will not give a talk. We are all tired and I think that we all want to go home and catch our flights. Anyway, um, I am the chair of a creation chapter and 
Next year will be your host for the General Conference and the GA. So, um, Mustafa said that we are aiming for a bigger event. I think it will be tough to follow, but we have a one year, exactly 13 months to prepare. So, uh, save the date for the conference. It is the end of the March. It will be nice and sunny. I'm not a god, I cannot predict the weather, but usually it is very nice and sunny in Zagreb. Anyway, we in, have a partnership with the uh, National Creation Tourist Board, and they provided a short video, so better play video. I just want to say that I'm not alone here. We have a team of 10 people, and three of them are with me. So please stand up if you cannot come here. <laughs> Looking forward to meet you in Zagreb next year. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Just last two notes. So I forgot to thank volunteers, conference volunteers, and also all the chapter chairs and the working group chairs. And uh, I hope this conference will give you more uh, thoughts for discussion, and you will in, you will use the discussions at the conference for your future uh, career. So we have the last thing. We will see you definitely in 2020, uh, 2020 in Croatia. But before that, we'd like to see you here. Tonight at 7 o'clock, Dark Side of Research at Otterkringer Brewery. Thank you very much. Just uh, a real quick note about tonight. Um, first of all, you can still buy tickets. Please, if you can, buy it now, but you can also buy it at the door. You can take the 44 tram to the location or the number two tram. Those are, the, I think, the two best options. And there is uh, food and drink available, and it's going to be extremely funny, and there's also going to be live music, and it's going to be a party, so please come. Okay, thank you, everybody, for everything. Thank you.